So in this episode, we learn that the Cerritos has t-shirts like this that just say Ritos, and then we have the Discovery has Disco. So does that mean on the Enterprise they have ones that say Enter or Prize? Or conversely, they could also say Terpri, which would honestly be my vote. Give me the Terpri shirt. Hello interwebs and welcome to my review of Star Trek Lower Decks, my favorite Star Trek show and I truly mean that after this episode because we are going to be talking about season 2, episode 9, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this correctly, Wee's Dooge? It, the title's in Klingon so I'm probably mispronouncing it somewhere down the line but regardless, uh, I'm going to do my spoiler free thoughts and then get into spoilers but I'm going to be honest with all of you, my spoiler free thoughts are going to have to be fairly quick here because this episode was fantastic and part of what is fantastic about it is just the basic concept of it and just to say what this episode is about and how it is structured would be to spoil the fun of it so I'm going to keep this brief and and kind of vague but I just have to tell you all up front this episode is a master class I, 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 I was writing notes normally I write notes when I review episodes and there are pages upon pages of notes here for just this one episode because this is only what 25 minutes and it was so dense and so packed not only did it manage to show us new characters give us new characters and arcs and, and make them feel complete and make them feel uh, fully fleshed out but it also developed our own characters on the Cerritos that we've come to know and love in really interesting ways and we get like we get small scenes that develop our characters and and big ones that develop uh, more for like characters like Boimler kind of has the sort of biggest arc here but also there's like meta commentary on the show upon itself and also meta commentary on Star Trek as a whole while also developing other cultures within Star Trek like this episode I know just when I get into my spoiler filled section there are are going to be things that I'm going to miss that I am just as excited about the stuff that I do talk about because this is just such a dense dense episode and it's very clear that like their Star Trek Lower Decks is making their ninth episode of their season sort of like their big breakout like break the rules episode because this is very similar to uh episode nine of last season's Trisis Point which sort of was like a big parody of Star Trek movies and again I can't say the concept of it because it's just this is too much fun to discover on your own but they're definitely trying something new taking a big risk doing something different different with this Lower Decks formula and this one even more so than I think Crisis Point was just a big swing and I think for me it connected. While I don't think that this episode has the emotional resonance that Crisis Point has, like the, the ending of that episode really gut punched me with uh, some emotional character moments for Mariner specifically, this episode doesn't necessarily have that but just the the density of it and the what they do with it, I could have seen this being developed into something even bigger, there's just so much in this. And I, I'm going to have to leave this at that, everybody, uh, because we need to get into spoiler-filled talk. And like I said, I'm going to miss because this episode was just phenomenal. And I, I am I am honestly so impressed by it. Yeah, I'm just going to have to leave it there because we're going to have to get into spoilers. So now that we're in the spoiler-filled section, folks, I just got to be right up front with you. Like I said, this episode is so dense. There are going to be things that I'm going to miss in this discussion that I, I'm just is equally excited about but it just I'm just going to miss it because this is just so packed dense and so I'm just going to go through it and, and we're going to discuss this. So we start off the episode with the crew basically getting R&R &R because they're on a really long warp uh, trip and so it turns out all the lower deckers for their R&R &R are having a sort of relationships with their uh, sort of upper decker counterparts except for Boimler. Boimler sort of feels left out and he sort of feels like oh I wish I could socialize with an upper decker crew member because then I could have a chance for promotion which again speaks to Boimler sort of not seeing it as like a like a chance to just socialize with people but still thinking in a career mind I liked that sort of development of his character but we get a sort of like reference here at the end of this that like oh what it would be like to be on like a Klingon ship and then all of a sudden the structure of this episode is revealed because we bounce over to a Klingon ship and we get to see the events of the lower decker crew on a Klingon ship but once we go over to the Klingon ship the first thing that I noticed that I really liked was that the writing was subtly cueing us that these characters have a very similar dynamic to our lower deckers over on the Cerritos that it's sort of like copying that and we get like subtle hints to that like one of the Klingons who's like looking in the mirror in that scene says like oh that's the worst kind of referencing what how Mariner uh, said that's the worst in the exact same way and fashion that she did it way back in the pilot episode of the series and so it's like little 
subtle character moments like that. It's just like referencing the fact that these are the same dynamics as our lower decker crews. And Oct, who's the Klingon that we're focusing on here for most of the episode, is basically the Klingon version of Boimler, a character who wants to sort of be seen by the commander, wants to actually move up in rank, and is so focused on that. And this is so incredibly brilliant in my mind, this like subtle seating in the back of our minds of this characterization, because one of the risks of this type of structure that this episode is doing, because it's not only focusing on this Klingon ship for a lot of this episode, it also introduces us to a Vulcan ship that we also focus on as well that does a very similar thing. It shows us the crew members from that point of view uh, on the lower decks and sort of builds out its own so whole storyline there as well. And so by subtly cueing us with these same character dynamics on the lower decks, it allows us to sort of instantaneously get the dynamics of it without beating us over the head with it. Like we instantly get where these characters are coming from without actually having to outright state it or beat us over the head with it or just sort of like make it very, very clear. It's just subtly priming us in that way and also allows this episode to not only teach us, uh, have a whole character arc for these characters because it's built on something we already established within the series, but also use it to flesh out this Klingon culture in its own specific way using a dynamic that is similar to what we were saying so it's sort of like showing the differences across cultures and how it affects these ensigns because we're still basing it off of that dynamic it guys this is just this is i'm two scenes in and this is brilliant it's brilliant and i just the breaking out of the structure to like focus on other lower decks uh ships is is phenomenal I, this is so good it's so good and so freaking dense. There's so many jokes in this scene that I couldn't even go over them. Like I like the 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 like the Klingons making fun of Vulcans, like oh logical and cower in bits it was just phenomenal. Like and saying they like complaining about replenishing blood wine is so great. But then this they sort of transition over to the Vulcan ship and we get a whole similar thing there. And I love this opening gag with the Vulcans sort of being like, "Are you available for chess? I am not available for chess later. I must do this." I am available for chess and it's just so standard and we meet an ensign named Talyn who is sort of like rebelling against Vulcan culture but it's so played like she just says like I feel I have an instinct but it's like she's still playing monotone and but all the Vulcans are calling her on as like what that outburst even though she's just like basically just subtly rebelling and the writing is so crisp and clean and again basing it off of a dynamic later on in this sequence I'll, I'll just focus on this Vulcan section for here we learn that Talyn is sort of like checking things she's like going uh, she's like doing things she's not supposed to she's not doing the logical next step but it is just sort of like all she's doing is like improving systems and things like that and when she brings it up to the captain the captain says we'll go and check this out but don't give me another outburst again such subtle writing and it gets us to another scene where she's assigned to meditate and focus on herself for two days but she doesn't want to do that because she actually wants to like focus on the task that she wants to do she wants to like do some other stuff and that's considered rebelling in Vulcan culture and we start to learn here because she starts to say like she wants to be the Chadich of these other Vulcans, um, which is a phrase that Mariner used way back in season one, episode one of Lower Decks as well. Be my Chadich from now on, baby. And we're primed here to understand that Talyn is basically the Vulcan version of Mariner. And again, again, you can see how they're like subtly priming us with these character dynamics so we can understand these characters and can emotionally invest in them because we only have such a short time in order to get to know them within this episode, considering that this is so condensed and packed in but there's also so many great jokes within here as well the, uh, the constant like that, that outburst even though she's just saying like small minor things that for us would just be like whatever feel but it also fits perfectly in with Vulcan culture as we know it and it, this is probably one of the most in-depthful looks we've gotten in Vulcan culture because this is the first time we really see Vulcans interacting only with other Vulcans for a prolonged amount of time same thing on the Klingon ship as well um, and so all of that is really really great and layered into here guys I'm like I'm almost out of breath with how excited I am about this. So I've kind of like run the gamut through the Vulcan stuff. There's a lot of like small stuff I could talk about in there and like little references and Easter eggs and, and little bits and pieces there. But flipping back as I throw my pen in just how excited, I'm just so excited, you guys. Uh, going back to the Klingon ship with, uh, I can never remember, Oct. I love seeing him try to do the Boimler thing of like trying to impress his captain, but ultimately kind of failing. Like he's just like, hey, I can I can do this. And uh, he watches as one of the uh, Klingons uh, kills another Klingon and he's hoping he can step into that role, but ultimately kind of embarrasses himself by falling underneath like a drunken guy during the Klingon like blood party, uh, whatever. And, and, and again, just like very much 
much boimlering it up. As we follow, Oct, he eventually goes up to the captain and sort of like proves that his medal in front of the captain where he's like, he's seen as small and weak uh, to the captain, but he says something along like Klingon blood is as red and pinkish red as ever, sort of referencing the weird pink blood that we saw in Star Trek VI, uh, the undiscovered country, which is always like a weird canon thing that people were pointing out that Klingon blood is pink. But anyways, he managed to impress the Klingon captain who says that you're a true Klingon, who ultimately reveals that he is the one uh, that has been this entire time this season uh, supplying the pack leads with their information and with their arms because he wants to decent stabilize the Federation. So all of this packlet stuff we've been seeing this entire season comes to a head here because it turns out the Klingons have been, or at least this Klingon captain, has been trying to do this just so he can gain power and destabilize the Federation and claim, and claim areas for himself and gain honor. But Oct sort of recognizes that Klingons don't let other people fight their battles for them. This isn't honorable. And so I love this whole setup. I also love the scene where the Klingon captain goes over to the packlet ship and the packlet says, well, we were testing the bomb and the bomb uh, went off and it worked, but it didn't work after. After that and it's like that's because it's a bomb it only works once which is fantastic but I like again we're subtly seeing Boimler's character arc played out in this guy we're starting to realize like oh I am actually a commander I am what it means to be a true Klingon something that Boimler struggles with he seems like a joke and uh, like a fool in the first few uh, episodes of season one but he's grown Boimler has grown into such a command presence these past few episodes and they've showing this in Oct as well in a similar arc where he is coming into his own as a commander very quickly and so uh, just to sort of skip to the end of his arc here he gets a scene where he just sort of says no we cannot arm the pack lads. we cannot do this this is wrong and he confronts the captain and actually takes on the captain and kills him in a really beautifully um uh, like the the animation for that sequence when they were fighting was great by the way um and eventually becomes captain and earns that and says this is not our fight and leaves during the middle of the the rest of the fight that's going on in that moment with the pack of the cerritos and the vulcan shit that shows up uh towards the end there and again the sort of interweaving of all these narratives coming to a head at once fantastic stuff uh Oh, it's so good. But I've already been talking for so long and I haven't even mentioned the storylines that are going on over on the Cerritos because Boimler is doing his stuff as well where he's sort of like trying to find his upper bridge crew member buddy to uh, to sort of have his R&R &R with and he runs into different situations with these characters. Like one of the first ones he runs into is with Kayshawn. There's a lovely little hysterical moment here with Kayshawn where he like miss says something in the uh, the Tamaranian language and actually calls Kayshawn fat which was really wonderful and sort of like pulling off that that joke that we, that Kayshawn like speaks differently in metaphor throughout this whole season. But then we go to a uh, pottery class where um, Shax and Rutherford were making pottery and Shax is just like, put your anger into the clay, put your anger into the clay. And uh, Boimler references, oh, that must be like on Bajor. And Shax freaks out, like has a PTSD moment where he, one of my favorite lines, he says like fighting fascism is a full-time job. Yes, it is. Yes, it is, Shax. I, I never I never felt you more than when you said that statement. But clearly referencing the um the Cardassian occupation of Bajor and the clear trauma that many Bajorans have went through. So that felt real, but was also funny and just his line, again, the fascism line right up there, I want that tattooed on my body. Um fantastic. Uh but Boimler has to run out of that situation. But then he runs into Ta'ana and Tendi on the hollow deck where they're doing a Star Trek V moment where they're climbing, they're basically um free soloing a mountain just like uh Kirk was in Star Trek 5 and Boimler comes up with the floaty boots from Star Trek 5. I also love his shirt. Uh, I forget the exact phrase, but I was laughing at it. Um, and 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 so he falls out because his boots sort of break or whatever. And uh, I love Ta'ana saying like, I don't know if those safeties are on or off, who cares? And just keeps going. And then Boimler hits the tree. And then Boimler uh, leaves this room and he uh, enters another holodeck where he runs into Mariner and um, Freeman, Captain Freeman, playing the game that uh, Seven of Nine and um, and uh, Janeway would play on Voyager. I forget the name of it. I know other people would uh, have said it to me before, but they're playing that game. And you, in th what I love about this is like it's funny because Boimler's trying to get out of this because they're like saying way too personal things to each other while they're getting in while they're doing this. But you also, in the background of this, you're getting layered information about how Freeman and Mariner are interplaying with each. Other. like you can just see the toxicity kind of in the relationship as they're sort of working stuff out in this moment so it's funny for Boimler but also stuff going on and teachings about Mariner and Freeman at the same time this is so efficient storytelling and I fucking love it oh my 
God, folks. But then Boimler gets uh, on the turbo lift. He's sort of worn out. He's defeated. But he hears Ransom and these other crew members talking about Hawaii. And eventually sort of like uh, inundates himself with them by pretending to be from Hawaii. He's like, oh, you're from the islands? Like, yeah, I totally am from the islands. And he starts appropriating Hawaiian culture, and which is deeply offensive, which the episode later brings up. Excellent. It's like, uh, you guys are all pretending to be Hawaiian. That's like insanely culturally insensitive, which it is. And I like that drawing attention to it, that, that within this trope. It's like a normal sitcom trope, like wanting to fit in so pretending to lie to fit in but it's also dealing with a way that's like star trekian and culture but also calls it out and comments on this trope this is something that this whole season has been doing these past few episodes which has been using like fairly standard sitcom tropes but twisting it subverting it and actually addressing some of the issues within it and i love that and it's all within this huge episode guys can you not tell how excited i am about this episode it it's so good! But then Boimler's hanging out with the Lower Decks crew members and sort of saying with them, uh, like, oh, should I, should I pretend to be Hawaiian? I feel a little bit awkward about it. It doesn't feel right. I also love that Rutherford is holding on to the, um, the Deep Space Nine not model that they were, that they were talking about way back in episode five of this season. So that's a nice payoff. And I love that Rutherford says, like, well, what would you rather? Would you rather, like, you know, get ahead or would you rather be true to yourself? And Boimler's like, that's, uh, you're right. And then it cuts to him immediately lying to, to get ahead. Uh, and it's sort of like, pretending to be a Hawaiian with the rest of the crew members on the holodeck, which is which was kind of funny. Also, at the same time, Mariner gets a call up to uh, hang out with her mother again. And I love this sequence where we go to them and they're playing uh, Clue. It's a Starfleet version of Clue. And I love the line where like Mariner says like, oh, I think it was the chef. And Freeman says like, you always think it's the chef. And then Mariner says like, well, we have replicators. Why do we need a chef? That's fishy. So good. It's so funny. I want, and also I want to buy it. If there's a Clue version of Star Trek, uh, a Star Trek version of Clue, I'll buy it. I want it. I, I need it. I have a Star Trek katana thing so i'm here for star trek themed board games just just saying just saying make it happen cbs paramount plus whoever is in charge of star trek whoever whoever's in charge make it happen but i also like the end of that scene where they get called to the bridge because they're dropping out of warp but i just like that small little moment where freeman says to mariners like i had a good time and mariner says yeah i did too it's like they're arguing is just how they relate to each other and i like that acknowledgement it's a very toxic relationship for sure and i'm sure that'll get fleshed out in future episodes but i just like that they weirdly enjoyed spending time with each other despite how argumentative they are with each other and i thought that that it was very Star Trek-y and very sweet. But they drop out of warp and they start to get attacked by the pack led ship that the Klingon ship is meeting with. So we're starting to see the intermingling of these storylines, which was so excellent. Um, and I like that it sort of paid off on the Klingon side of the storyline because Oct is able to take on the captain and warp away, so saving the Cerritos because they don't have to fight two ships at that moment because the Cerritos clearly would have been destroyed otherwise. So I like that that arc complements this arc. Um, but also at the same time, because they're being attacked, Boimler comes uh, clean about not being Hawaiian and everyone admits that none of them were Hawaiian. They were all just trying to impress each other but then they all realize that they're from moons and Boimler tries to get in on that and they're like that's deeply offensive and that's where Boimler says the Hawaiian saying you were Hawaiian is even more offensive which was absolutely great a nice little payoff to uh his storyline about like you don't have to try to fit in because Ransom even says I just wanted to like you for you even though the it gets a little bit subverted by the moon thing Ransom saying I wanted to just know you all for you was uh just a sweet little Star Trekian bookend to this episode for for Boimler's story uh just like oh it's all about accepting us for who we are and i thought that that was deeply sweet um and wonderful but back on the bridge the cerritos is getting beaten up by the uh by the pack led ship which by the way we get a quick cutaway to the lower decks of the pack led ship and we get red alarm red alarm and the pack led's just being like oh i'm hungry you should go eat perfect and i was just like the pack led ship is like the pack led like humongous or something the name of the ship was just funny as well i i can't remember off the top of my head because there's just so much here but the cerritos is getting pounded and destroyed but then the vulcan ship the lower decks that we were seeing from the other side of the Lower Decks with uh, Talyn shows up and it turns out that Talyn's, the thing that she was working on that she was eschewing meditation for was the thing that is able to power up the shield of the Vulcan ship and is able to enable them to save the Cerritos and able to beat um, beat back the pack led ship and it's a really cool animated sequence, really just awesome and jaw dropping and I love that when they finally beat the pack led ship, Freeman calls the Vulcan commander, also wearing the Rito shirt which I want them, let me buy those as well, so much merchandise that I want from this episode by the way um, and the Vulcan just like well there's no logical reason for us to be talking you're all fine we're all fine we're gonna leave now and uh just going away 
great stuff. Uh, but then I also like Freeman deducing that the Klingons decided that it wasn't their fight, so something must have been going on with the Klingons and the Packleds. I like her sort of figuring that out. Hey everybody, so quick note, uh, at this point in the video, uh, my video camera stopped recording because my memory card filled up because I had been gushing for so long about this episode. Uh, yeah, I talked for so long that my memory card literally could not fill it up. That's how dense this episode was. Um, that being said, I decided not to re record that section after I realized what had happened because my excitement for this episode is so palpable um, and I felt so earnestly honestly excited about it and I just wanted to gush it out and I really just wanted to share that excitement with all of you and I don't want to have to try and recapture that I just want to share it earnestly with you um, and so for that reason you're just going to get the audio from here on out I do apologize for that uh, but it is because I just want to share with you my earnest um, passion and excitement for this episode so sorry it's just going to be audio only um, but just know it's out of excitement and passion so that's the reason. But then back on the Vulcan ship with Talyn, I like that she gets told off by her boss because she's, again, the mariner of this ship and she's sort of seen as the rebellious one. She doesn't fit in here and so she's being downgraded off or she's being uh, sent off of duty and we get a little hint here that she's going to be sent to a Starfleet ship, which seems weird to me because she's not in Starfleet. So it seems weird that they can just assign her to a Starfleet ship, but I guess Vulcans just go wherever they're assigned. But it's interesting because I think that means that Talyn will either be showing up next episode or next season over on the Cerritos, which is absolutely fantastic because I really liked her character and I liked her being sort of like a Vulcan version of Mariner. And we even get another hint at that where at the end when she's leaving the room for with another outburst, she says live long and prosper, but she has just the air of sarcasm to it. Just like Mariner did the sarcastic Vulcan salute last season. So you just see this connection, but in a very, Vul like she's Mariner, but in a very Vulcan way. It's not like sarcastic Vulcan salute. It's just like a subtle, subtle sarcastic delivery. Perfect Perfection. Perfection. But there's still one last thing because the episode ends with Boimler saying, hanging out in the bar, feeling a little upset about sort of being dismissed and not really able to find a buddy. But then a small, younger crew member comes up to Boimler and says like, oh, I, I want your help. Uh, you know, I heard you're so um, organized and I heard that from Ransom. And, it re and Boimler realizes that even though he w didn't really hang out with all of them, wasn't super close friends, Ransom has recognized Boimler's skill over the past few episodes and how he's grown. And we've seen that subtly seeded throughout the past few episodes as Boimler has come into his own as commander. And it's a very sweet moment because Boimler learns that it wasn't about hanging out with the better people all the time and, and getting to socialize with the better people, sorry, hang, but socialize with the upper deckers, but about just finding someone who you can learn from, whether you're teaching them or they're teaching you. And that is so Star Trek. So Star Trek. And the final scene of the episode uh, after that little heartwarming moment is we get one more Lower Decks crew and it is the Borg ship and it's just them <laughs> regenerating as the credits roll. And I also like that their eyes kind of corresponded to Starfleet colors as well. Their, their little eye sensors correspond with different colors uh, with the crew members, um, sort of showing that they're also a similar dynamic. At, like in a Borg way, they have a similar dynamic as our uh, Lower Dexian crew. If it's not obvious, which I, I don't know how it's not, this episode, in my mind, is a true masterclass. I, like I said earlier, I don't think this one hit emotionally for me um, as well as Crisis Point did because I thought that one was just, I thought was brilliant on an emotional level for Mariner. But having just talked all this through, having just sat here and gushed for how how long? <sighs> Way too long, 30 minutes about this episode. I, this is not going to do well in the algorithm, but screw it. I just wanted to gush about this episode. I thought this was fantastic. This episode managed to be both boundary breaking, uh, break up the formula, take a risk and do something new, manage to make us invest in the storylines of brand new characters, but doing so in a way that not only um, use our sort of sub using subtle cues uh, from our knowledge of just the structure of lower decks, our lower decks ensigns, using that to invest in these characters quickly and uh, easily and just get into their arcs, but also doing that in a way that also comments on these characters, but also comments on our lower decks crew members as well and comments and 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 sort of juxtaposes uh with their arcs sort of like just sort of being a subtle commentary on what Boimler and Mariner have been going through these past few seasons and the rebellious nature and Boimler becoming a, a captain as well have sort of his arc while also introducing a new character in a new way while also just like showing us cultures uh, from a perspective that we've never gotten we've never gotten Klingon culture a Vulcan culture from this viewpoint before um and it was just truly fantastic and on top of that still managing to tell a story with one of our 
characters over on the Cerritos that still felt impactful and meaningful, while also, at the same time, using his story to just briefly touch upon sweet moments with our actual characters, like with, with Freeman and um, Mariner getting to have moments to, like, reconcile as mother and daughter and having that sweet moment. And I honestly to God, have no idea how they managed to do it in 25 minutes because my gushing about this episode is longer than the episode itself and I do not feel bad about that. Normally they say reviews should not be longer than the actual episode itself. I don't always follow that rule, but generally that's a good rule. For this one, I, I don't know how you possibly could. It is so good. And it proves to me why Lower Decks is my favorite show. I've had criticisms this season that I still think hold up, but this episode just proves to me why this show is just fan fantastic, phenomenal. Um, all the words. All the words. I loved it. I'm going to have to end this video because it's already way too long. Uh, again, this is not going to do well in the algorithm, so please like and subscribe and do all that fun stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, I just wanted to gush about this episode because it is excellent. Truly excellent. I don't mean to say this to aggrandize myself, um, but I do know that a few people from the show sometimes watch my reviews um, just here and there. Uh, whether you're an animator or writer or whatever, I just want to let you know you did a fantastic job. Everyone uh, on that team, um, you working together, I say this with absolute sincerity. Truly thank you. I have not been this excited about us. I mean, I love all, all the Star Trek that's been coming out, but this was one that just got me so excited and so pumped. So thank you to all of you for the work that you do, because uh, this was excited. I, I, I am so pumped for the finale. I don't know how I could possibly live up to this one, but uh, yeah, great job. I'm going to end this. I have to end this. Thank you so much, everybody. Live long and prosper. I adore you. Uh, I'm going to go sleep now because I'm just too excited. <laughs> oh. Okay. Oh my god, this is so difficult to talk about. <laughs> One more time. I'm not even sure where to begin. Oh my god, how do I even get into this? Sorry, Lucian. Oh boy. Alright, let's do this. Uh, alright.